He said, can you please explain the pros and cons of using percentiles in Sabersim? For example, I saw that Mr. Clean in his NHL process changes his lineups to the 95th percentile, and those are the ones he plays. How does that affect the builds? Yeah, let's talk about this first, just from what does this do? Literally, what, what impact is this having on the process? And then we'll wrap around and we'll talk about pros and cons or reasons I think you should or shouldn't use this. So uh, we'll do a quick build. We'll do NBA tonight, build 500 lineups or so here, and then we'll we'll take a look. Um, one thing to note here is that if you are going to use percentiles, um, and we want to add a note here in the app so that the messaging is clear here, but you won't be able to use these percentiles if you are using custom projections, basically of of any kind, really. Um, whether that's if you're using like the run pure projections or an average of the two, um, or uh, if you're using your own custom projections or are changing projections at all, right? Um, you're not going to be able to, the percentiles won't really work. So good thing to note there, this is something that you would only really want to do if you weren't using custom projections at all. And maybe that's actually like a, a good note of like when to use it. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and say we were doing this and let's say we're setting every player to the 85th percentile. So what's actually happening here, the lineups are already built. The Sims are already run. Two things that common misconceptions. When you change this percentile to 85th percentile, we are not rerunning Sims and we are not rebuilding the lineups. What we are doing is we are shifting everybody's, every player's, not everybody's, every player's basically their distribution so that their new mean, right? So that their new mean outcome, whatever it was before, is now shifted to be the outcome that they score 15% of the time or less. That's because it's the 85th percentile outcome, right? So the net effect in general terms, what you get here is you get lineups, you get you sort to the top lineups that probably have a little bit higher upside or stand to gain, stand to win a little bit more when the upside is reached, right? When they have that outcome at the expense of average performance, right? The average, the average performance of your lineups may go down a bit. Your min cash equity may go down a bit at, at the benefit of adding upside, right? The reason Mr. Clean, for example, talks about doing this in NHL and particularly up to upping it all the way to the 95th percentile, which is a pretty high outcome, is because hockey is a high variance sport, right? Uh, players are not normally distributed, right? And differentiation is important, right? So really on the hockey side, right? Let me show you kind of what I mean here and how those three things come together. So this is true of baseball too. I did kind of an analysis of this over in baseball season, but especially for um, non-goalies, right? You are going to have skaters that are projected better than others on any given night, right? At the average. The value that you get of this, this slightly higher value for a player like Anthony Duclair uh, at 5,700 projected around the same as some of these other high salary guys is diminished as you go to the 95th percentile, right? These high variance players, we can just look at like a range of outcomes curve for some of these skaters. Their 95th percentile outcomes tend to kind of condense. They kind of approach a similar number most of the time, right? And despite the fact that one skater may have a much better average projection than another, right? We don't really care in GBPs what actually happens at the averages. We care what happens at the ceilings. So what you end up doing is when you sort and you build lineups here and you sort by 95th percentile, right? The net effect of that you get is basically say, in some ways, ignore the outcomes that don't even lead to my success in these contests to begin with. For, for Mr. Clean, that's anything under the 95th percentile outcome, right? And give me the lineups in my pool that are the best when the players reach that ceiling outcome. And because skaters in hockey and, and stacks and things like that have similar 95th percentile outcomes, or the difference between the best projected players and the worst projected players is closer at the 95th percentile than it is at the average, you end up with lineups that are typically more diversified, probably a little bit more contrarian, and don't really lose any ceiling equity. But they do lose the average outcome, right? Because you're playing players that are projected worse on average, but they have a similar ceiling. That is essentially what you get out of doing this. That's that's kind of the explanation for why I always say the quick answer is you get lineups with theoretically more upside at the expense of average performance is because that's what actually happens, right? And we could probably see this here in a second, but typically um, it's not necessarily true for every single slate, but typically what you'll see is if we just look at our exposures to certain players, 
um, and how often certain players show up in our pool, right? We will probably see that by updating this, so you can kind of get an idea, right? We have a lot of Colorado. Um, we're pretty well exposed to our, a lot of Florida, um, pretty well exposed to our, our biggest players on the, the slate, right? If we change this to 95th, what we should see in general is, is some diversification. Now we're still sorting through the entire pool of 500. So it won't be as diversified as building lineups at 95th percentile in the first place. Um, Okay, so in this particular case, and maybe that's just the way the projections are working out this night, but in this particular case, we actually don't really, we don't really see too much diversification from changing this. But that's, I would say, on average, what you would probably expect to happen. I think it's best used now kind of moving to the pros and cons. I think this is best used for higher variance sports, right? Where your sim variance slider, if you're, if you're confused where that, where that is, right? Where your sim variance slider is a little bit higher to begin with, um, or in sports where... Right, like so you can see, like I. Oh, actually, I think I know what happened here. I didn't build these with the proper default settings, so we ended up with a lineup. We ended up with a lineup pool that was not as diverse as it should have been, anyway. But you can see for hockey, right, for a twenty max, for example, right, the sim variance is going to be a lot higher than it is in a ten game, an equivalently sized NBA slate, right. So sports where your sim variance slider is going to be high to begin with, I think this is a, a better idea. Um, I also think. Or slates, right? On an NBA slate that is three games or four games versus a 10-game slate, right? It makes more sense uh, that, that that slate is higher variance than a 10-game slate, right? I think it makes more sense there. Um, I uh, Oh, I also think it's a good idea in, in sports that have less normally distributed players, right? In basketball, players are not perfectly normal, normally distributed, but they are more normally distributed than another sport. And what I mean by that, just to be clear, is that you get a bell curve type look for a player's range of outcomes. And the reason why updating percentiles for NBA, I don't think is going to provide as much value is because when you have this kind of bell curve type curve for a player, their 95th percentile is fairly predictable from their mean outcome. In other words, you don't actually end up with very different lineups changing your percentiles in a sport like NBA because the 95th percentile generally follows from the mean outcome right? If a player is a good play at the average, they're also probably a good play at the ceiling. Whereas in higher variance sports where players are not normally distributed, like hockey, baseball, even football to an extent, especially certain positions, that's not as much the case. So summing this up, right? We'll wrap this question up here. Uh, overall, I think what you get out of using, well, what you get out of using percentiles is you end up with lineups that probably have higher upside, are more differentiated, and are probably a bit more contrarian than using the average projection. I think they are best used on sports where they are, players are not normally distributed and the sports or the slate or the contest plays very high variance to begin with. Um, and you can't use them at least at the moment with the way the app is set up when you're using custom projections of any kind. So I feel like that's probably one of the more thorough responses I've given to the percentiles question on stream so far. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, if you're asking for my personal take, it's not something that I use all too often. Personally, it just hasn't really kind of found its way into my process at all. Um, but that's not to say it, it's a bad idea. Um, and, and Mr. Clean uses them pretty heavily to quite a bit of success, at least in NHL. So um, definitely something to at least explore. So... And as always, especially for, for some of you that are, are maybe more new to SaberSim, the best way, the single best way to get familiar with what something does, what impact it has on your lineups or your player pool or anything like that, is experiment with it. And experiment with it when you have time, right? If you have 30 minutes before lock and you're trying to get lineups in, not the best time to uh, go into the laboratory and start messing around with stuff, right? But when you have time and you have maybe a little bit of time at your lunch break or whatever during the day, um, go, see, go, go run some builds. Run some builds for NBA, run some builds for hockey, whatever you play, run some builds for, for NFL um, and see see what happens when you change the percentiles. See what that does to your exposures and your player pool and your lineups and things like that. Uh, the last note, I should have mentioned this before, is I would be very cautious in general with the 99th percentile overall. Uh, those are extreme ceiling outcomes. Those are three standard deviations away, approximately three standard deviations away from the mean outcome at that point. Um, very low outcome events. You will see some pretty extreme scores there, especially at lower salary players, right? Um, a 99th percentile outcome for Miles McBride, who I don't even know who that is, to be completely honest, on the Knicks, uh, is a 40-point outcome at 3,500, right? 
these are these are pretty extreme outcomes. Um, there's nothing. There's not necessarily. It's there's not necessarily. It's wrong to do this, but just be prepared. I have seen before people go in, they build their lineups, they set it to 99th percentile, they enter their lineups without really looking at it, and they're like, "Why do I have uh, 90% Josh Christopher? Like, who is Josh Christopher? What's going on here?" Well, you 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 sorted the lineups by what the the one percent outcome was for all the players in the pool. So yeah, you you got some weird names in there. You're taking some pretty high variant shots. That's that's the effect you get of that. So be careful with that those extreme percentiles. I would ex experiment with the eighty fifth and ninety fifth first.